One Saturday night in 1978, terrible events began to unfold close to a surf life saving club on Barranjoey Road. It was just after midnight when 18-year-old Trudy Adams left the surf club dance. Public transport was unreliable, so she decided to hitchhike home. Trudy Adams was never seen again. It's a 40-year-old mystery that still haunts a family and a community and points to a criminal monster with police connections, allowed to roam free for years. My name is Ruby Jones. I'm an investigative journalist. I'm working with crime reporter Neil Mercer. We're investigating the unsolved disappearance and almost certain murder of Trudy Adams. What really intrigues me is this was such a big, high-profile case, and it's the largest search in New South Wales history, and it's all over the newspapers, and mm. everybody wants to know what's happened to Trudy Adams. And there's also clear suspects, and yet nothing happens. After Trudy disappeared, a series of young women reported they'd been abducted on or near Barranjoey Road, brought to bushland and raped. Altogether, 14 women came forward. Police suspected a link between Trudy and the rapes. Two sets of suspects emerged, but initially neither was fully investigated and no one was charged. It appears they were in the sites pretty early. The question is, why didn't they ever get them? Whoever took Trudy got away with it. Whoever raped 14 young women got away with it. There's a great injustice here. I think that there is a chance that we could find something that was overlooked for whatever reason um, back when she did disappear. This case goes to bigger things how violence against women has often gone unpunished. But times have changed, and now, across society, there's a reckoning. What happened that night on Baron Joey Road? Since Trudy's disappearance, police have investigated the case four times. We requested access to their files, but they refused, saying they don't wish to participate out of consideration for Trudy's family. We contacted Trudy's brother John, but he also declined. Trudy's disappearance remains traumatic. I think the important thing is to do an investigation that has the family in mind. Make sure we're doing something that does the family justice, honours Trudy's memory, and that can potentially still get answers. See what the Manly Daily has to offer us. We've got questions about those early investigations into Trudy's disappearance. We've heard that a local newspaper clashed with police soon after Trudy went missing. June 28, 1978. Grave fears for missing girl. Parents of an 18-year-old Avalon girl missing since she was last seen getting to a panel van three days ago. Fear she's been murdered. That looks like a passport photo. It, it says yeah. it's a passport photo taken last week for a visit to Bali. And already here we're starting to see evidence of other young women coming forward saying that they've been attacked, assaulted. What's this pistol? Two girls were bailed up by a man with a pistol after they accepted a lift with him from Manly. Forced them to lie on the floor of the vehicle, put a blanket over them, and then tried to rape them. Many rape victims only came forward after Trudy disappeared. Some saying they were too terrified to report what happened. 
When Manly Daily reporters began asking why, the police hit back. There has also been a curious attempt by some people in high places to stifle the Daily in its full reporting of these terrible events. The newspaper will not be silenced. It has a duty to the community it serves. What are they saying? I think there's an implied threat in there. If you keep reporting this, if you keep being critical of the police, we won't talk to you anymore. I don't think this is frontline detectives. No, it doesn't this, sound this, like it's they're saying it's some people in high places. In high so. places. Just by reading of it, and I don't know, it's probably the police hierarchy going, we've got a big problem on our hands here. A young woman has, has gone missing. She's almost certainly been murdered. And all of a sudden, we've got all these other young women coming forward who are saying they're too scared to go to the cops. What is unfolding here is making the police, the New South Wales police, look very bad. In the late 1970s, the papers were pressing police to stop drug crime. The northern beaches of Sydney were a hotspot for the expanding illicit drug trade. Trudy was planning a holiday in Bali. Some, including Trudy's mum, Connie, believed she was being pressured to be a drug mule. Connie died not knowing what happened to her daughter. One of the key questions will be, what role did the escalation of drug dealing play in Trudy's disappearance? There you go. John, how are you? Oh, good. Manly Library archivist John McRitchie has researched Trudy's case and the Northern Beaches drug scene for 10 years. June 23, 1979. This is a year later. It mentions a drug connection. Mrs Adams believes her daughter may have been killed because she was the meat in the sandwich over a drug deal. She said she found a letter which intimated that a drug deal was coming up. Trudy would have blown the whistle on any drug dealings, she said. She was against drugs. If you go through any of these volumes from the 70s, any page you care to look at, there are references to drug activity. This is one. $20,000 heroin pushes jailed. Mm. The drug area is a social absence. Well, judge blasts peninsula drug scene. Yeah, is it your sense that the full story hasn't really been explored? Yeah. I think there was definitely more to her murder than the casual sex killing. I think she stood up to their own people. In resisting them? Yep. There are definitely undercurrents that you can only get hints of through the newspapers. It makes you very scared for her. Without Trudy's body or other physical evidence, theories like John's have continued. Like us, John's not only interested in her death, but her life. 12 year old Trudy Adams hopes to make a career as a ballet dancer. She recently won honours in third grade for classical ballet. Like any 12 year old girl, she wants to be a ballerina. Sure. So much to live for. All that wasted, wasted promise. So she's 12. Mm -hmm. well, I'm thinking about the creeps that came along and took that away. Well, I can't put it to rest. It's the back of my mind every minute I think we need to always have in our minds what we're trying to achieve for Trudy's family and more generally for the whole community. And that is we want to find out what happened to Trudy, who's responsible and where her body is. Was Trudy killed for refusing to be a drug mule? Connie said she found a letter to support this theory. But if this letter exists, where is it? She was due to go to Bali, and obviously her mum has got this, this firm idea that something happened to her in relation to that. Presumably yeah. she would have given the letter to police if she found some letter that referenced you, drug dealing. You would think so. You would think so. We don't have access to the police evidence, but we'll keep looking for this letter to try to solve the mystery of whether Trudy's disappearance was drug related. But there's another mystery that hampered this case from the start. Confusion about the make and colour of the vehicle Trudy hitched a ride with on Baron Joey Road. We know the police at least initially thought it was a green combi. That was their first radio message. It's a green combi. But then by the next day that had changed to a light coloured panel van. The police investigation revealed two sets of suspects, 
One set linked to a panel van, the other to a combi. Trudy's boyfriend from the time, Steve Norris, was the last one to see her alive as she got into a panel van after a dance at the Newport Surf Club in 1978. Steve Norris has always been certain that the vehicle he saw was a fawn or beige Holden panel van. But Trudy's mum, Connie, was convinced that Steve told her it was a green Volkswagen combi. Don't know where that came from. Couldn't imagine me saying it was a green combi when, it, when I knew it wasn't, but how, how do you know? The first suspect we're going to look into owned a light-coloured Holden panel van. His name was Neville Brian Tween. He was a safe breaker, drug dealer and convicted sex offender. Though he died in jail in 2013, Tween and his police connections still cast a long shadow over Trudy's disappearance and the rapes. A number of the rape victims identified Tween as one of their attackers. All the rape victims were between 16 and 18 years old, often from the Newport area, often while trying to hitch a ride. The attacks were apparently particularly vicious. In 1978, Tween lived in the area. He knew the beaches and nearby bush. But despite being identified, Tween wasn't questioned about Trudy or the rapes. If you have enough evidence to charge people for some attacks and some rapes, then you kind of begin the process. But yeah. when nothing happens, when they never get interviewed or charged, you know, I just feel like that's a missed opportunity. Yeah, well, they, they wouldn't be interviewed. If the cops showed up on Neville Tween's door, he would know, he would just not talk to them. Yeah, but if they had enough evidence to charge him, yeah. that's a different story. He was a hardened criminal, very violent. And he doesn't have to talk. They can't force him. It's not clear to me why police didn't push harder on Neville Tween. And when they couldn't find Trudy's body, the investigation went cold. But six months after Trudy vanished, police became interested in a new group of young men. These men from the Sydney suburb of Roselands were overheard boasting that they'd killed Trudy Adams. Some of them had been visiting the northern beaches and one had a green combi. These were the first links between the so-called Roselands lads and Trudy. Who were these men from Roselands? And were their boasts true? The Roselands lads are this loose group of young guys who all hang out together at the Roselands shopping centre. They're from the western suburbs, the leader of this group of guys, his name's Ray, and he delivers these Ray reports all the time. He mentions fights and things that he's done. It's this whole culture of bravado and bragging. The stories told about Trudy by some Roselands lads are so horrible they're difficult to repeat. One of the stories is that a group of the Roselands lads picked up Trudy Adams in a green combi van. They tried to have sex with her. She jumped out of the side of the combi van, hit her head on a telegraph pole. Some of them had sex with her, then dumped her body. A witness who can't be named reported this story to police in 1983. She was the girlfriend of one of the Roselands lads and claimed her boyfriend confessed to being involved after reading an article about the Trudy case. Another version of the story was even more bizarre. This version of events, which also involves some of the Roselands lads picking up Trudy Adams in a combi van, but that a white panel van came up behind them as they were picking her up and sort of followed them for a little while. The secret witness said she was told that the panel van seemed to be deliberately following the green combi. And that when the Roselands lads stopped at a curbside, the panel van pulled up behind them. She was told the panel van then took off, but reappeared later on 
when the Roselands lads were burying Trudy's body. Just adds to this utter confusion about a white coloured panel van and a green combi. But the thing is, there was enough people who overheard the bragging, who overheard the rumours, who thought, well, that actually could be true. I'd better go and make a statement to police. Despite these new leads, the Roselands lads were not taken seriously as suspects. The question is, why not? What's coming up is an awful lot of questions about the original police investigation. Was it well resourced? How long did it last? I have a feeling that when they didn't find Trudy, the investigation sort of not necessarily petered out, but police were taken off to do other things. Uh, and it became, well, a cold case. But the story of the Roselands lads was far from over. In the 90s, police got a fresh tip off that sent them back to Roselands. It was thought Trudy was dragged into a panel van, but police are now certain it was a lime-coloured combi van carrying a group of men. The police came out hard. Very reliable information. Now, I'd say our best breakthrough at this stage to solve the disappearance of Trudy. They reopened the investigation into the Roselands lads, raising the hopes of those close to Trudy. Trudy's boyfriend, Stephen Norris, was the last person to see her alive and helped in the search. Today, Mr Norris expressed relief. I always thought one day something's going to come up somewhere, someone on the line, that something happened, but when? But it's surprising, it's been 17 years, it's a long time. This breakthrough is certain to haunt those responsible for Trudy Adams' murder. After so long, it appears their dark secret will once and for all be revealed. This time, police did interview and fully investigate the Roselands lads, but they didn't find enough evidence to press charges. I feel for Trudy's family and for people like Steve Norris, you can see from Steve Norris's face that he's hopeful you know, that Trudy's yeah. disappearance will be solved by police in 1995. Yeah. Yeah. But if the Rosen's lads had been investigated properly back in 1978, then it would, you know, this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. The police wouldn't have revisited and suddenly gone, oh, there's this lead that's been overlooked and, you know, gone down that path. I didn't want vengeance. I just wanted to know what happened to her. Say it's a mother's privilege or something, I don't know. But it's a very hard entry. And it's the back of my mind every minute of the day. So what happened? How could the police have run so hot and cold? We're meeting former cold case detective Gavin McKean. In 2008, he re-examined all the evidence in Trudy's case, including links to the Roselands lads. It's in 1995 when there's a reinvestigation that they come to notice, and there are some coincidences, if at, at the very least. Can you explain what they were? Yeah, so, I mean, they had a, a green combi, so if we say it was the combi, then that would be a coincidence. One of the guys uh, that was looked at in this particular Roselands group had a girlfriend allegedly over in that area and so had reason uh, to be in the area. The northern beaches? Yes, the northern beaches. But from my review of the investigation it was pretty clear that it was only ever said in a way that was not believed. Mm. Having uh, significant experience working in homicide matters, it's not unusual to get people big noting themselves about crimes uh, that are very, very high profile. You might think it sounds insane for someone to do that, but it's not actually that uncommon. And that's what these guys essentially did, sprouting on about being involved in the matter. And it just, it, it, to me, it didn't seem plausible. I suppose mm. that's what I've struggled with a bit because I don't understand why anyone would make up a specific story like the ones that they were telling. I don't understand why people do a lot of the things they do, but it does happen. People do make up stories to gain attention, to big note themselves. One of the lads that was involved in this had some mental problems. So that may be a reason enough. From my understanding of that investigation, they expired as many leads as they could and they weren't able to compile enough inculpatory evidence against these, these men to, to warrant any further action or any charges. 
Gavin's convinced the Roselands lads were just big noting themselves. But they were suspects for a murder for decades. We'd like to give them the right to reply. The Roselands Mall was Sydney's first big shopping complex. It's where the Roselands lads hung out in the late 70s. We want to find Ray, who we're told was the group's leader. We're going to go and knock on his door. He owned a green combi at the time that Trudy Adams disappeared and he was part of this group of young men that was bragging about abducting, uh, raping and murdering Trudy. One of the things we do know about members of this family is that they do have a criminal history. So whether they'll be pleased to see us or not, uh, I doubt it. Ray wasn't home when we arrived, but with the help of a family member, we contacted him on his mobile. We had quite a conversation. Uh, he said, quote, it's, it's all fucking bullshit, unquote. We had nothing to do with it, and it's the, all bullshit from the coppers. Um, and did he, he mention he, the green combi? He all? did, yeah. he did. I said, you, you, but you did own a green combi. And he said, yes, I did, but I didn't even know how to bloody well drive it at the time that Trudy disappeared. He says it's all rubbish. And he was pissed I, off about the inquest. He, he, well. was, he was not happy about being called to the inquest um, and he blamed New South Wales police. He said the cops wanted some revenge on his family. They tried to get him linked up with the disappearance of Trudy Adams. He said absolutely nothing to do with it. It was all rubbish, the whole, the whole thing. It'd be great if he could say that publicly. That's what I said to him. He said, no, no, no. At the coronial inquest, Ray denied having anything to do with Trudy and says he never boasted about it. Having talked to Gavin McKean, we agree with the coroner's finding. It's unlikely that the Roselands lads abducted and killed Trudy. But what of the police investigation at the time? It was surprising to watch the media around the 1995 police case against the Roselands lads because that be because they talked about it with a lot of certainty. But I think, on reflection, that was probably a strategy. They were trying to shake out the Roselands lads, rattle them. If they were guilty and had done it, maybe they would pick up the phone to each other and reveal information that presumably could have been caught by police surveillance. So I think it's likely that that was why they, they appeared to have such certainty when perhaps they didn't. We're on to a new lead, and it comes from an old suspect. Stephen Norris is Trudy's ex-boyfriend and the last person known to see her alive. We've interviewed him and believe he wasn't involved in Trudy's disappearance. Now he's called us with some unexpected news. Steve kept documents that were used as evidence during the inquest. He's invited us back to look at them. What I'm really hoping is there'll be some information from the original police investigation in 1978, some original evidence, because then we can have some sort of idea of, you know, how their investigation went and what they had access to. Well, let's hope there's some of the documents that we've been looking for that might answer some of the questions that we've been basically asking since the beginning of the project. Got those documents I told you about the other day. Right. See, they are the, the volumes there. How long have you had these for? Well, since the coroner's inquest, so 2011. Great. From a reporter's point of view, oh, this yeah. is like finding some buried treasure. Wow. Yes. Mate, yes. Yeah. Fair income with yeah, you. This exactly. is just sure. like everything's in there from everything day one. From day one. This yeah. is the complete the brief evidence, evidence from the wow. coroner's inquest. <laughs> Look at the date, 24th of the 6th, 78. This is the very first one. Missing from 154 Central Road, Avalon. Last scene, et cetera, et cetera. And this is so valuable because we can speak to police officers who were there at the time, but yeah. they can't remember a lot of this detail anymore because it's 40 years ago. Yeah. But this is, you yep. know, a record of exactly what happened. Yes. It's yeah. all recorded. And, and statements in there, and you name it. There's there. what appears to be hundreds of pages. Yes. This is a lot of the Roselands lads. What was that like to listen to? Look, I straight away had a feeling that these guys, they were just bragging, talking. You could just tell straight away it wasn't that. I felt, that's what I felt. Documents relating to tween, people coming forward with information. There was one that took my eye just because it was about 
27. tweens, associates talking in the uh, exercise yard of a jail, how they mentioned about northern beaches, girls yeah, getting picked yeah. up. It's our first sight of Neville Tween's alleged associate, Leonard Evans. Although he denies it, this is what a cellmate says Evans told him in a prison exercise yard. Oh yeah, me and Tweeny used to have a good thing going on. We used to cruise up and down the highway and look for hitchhikers. And we saw a girl hitchhiking, we used to pick her up and make her sit in the back seat. As soon as we got going again, we used to stick a gun in her face. Mm. It goes on. Oof. Victims said their abductors wore disguises, wigs and false beards. And we used to make her lie down in the back and put the cuffs on her. We used to have her own private spot at the National Park. Photographs of some of the evidence. So handcuffs located in bushland at Terry Hills. I think most of the girls that came forward straight after that all said similar. Mm. You know, this gun thing and yeah. taken mm. up to a remote area and it was also similar, so it was just constantly happening between 74, 78. Yeah, it sounds like it was the same MO every time. Yeah. It was like this routine that they had. Yeah, there's pretty full on stuff in there. Is it all right if we take these with us for a couple of months to, yep. to, to look through them? Yep, absolutely. You take them and go through them and take as long as you need. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all right. Really appreciate Pleasure. questions about what happened to some of these leads, we're going to find out by reading those seven volumes. This is five here. Seven of seven. <sighs> One of the first things we look for is the letter that Connie believed linked her daughter's disappearance to drugs. Nothing. But we find another letter a glimpse into Trudy's world. This is a letter that Trudy wrote on Saturday. It's written within 24 hours of her disappearing. It's written to a friend who I think is in Canberra. She just seems so happy and carefree and so sweet. She says here, I've just been reading in the sun with mummy and eating avocado in brackets, yummy, exclamation mark. <laughs> like, it's just really sweet. She talks about Norrie, as she calls him, Steve Norris, and says that he's been coming over, they've been drinking wine and hanging out. We often knock over a bottle of wine, smoke ciggies and gundangs, or even sneak outside for a quick scooby, exclamation, exclamation. Connie thought someone was pushing Trudy to courier drugs on her upcoming trip to Bali. Trudy's letter does mention the holiday and drugs, but not in the way Connie suspected. Can you imagine when I land in Bali, step off the plane, see my friends pieced out Bali groovers waving from the fence. <laughs> she's obviously really excited about this trip to Bali. She says to the person that she's writing to, don't worry, we'll get you something pretty from Bali. And then in brackets, she's got, oops, I don't mean drugs. <laughs> kind of humorous to think about her joking about something like that when within a few weeks, people are like seriously speculating on whether or not she was a drug runner from Bali. Whereas here, you know, obviously she's just kidding around. In one of these folders, there's a document I've read where police interviewed um, a group of people who actually did do a drug run, lived in that area, and they knew Trudy, and the police said, what do you think of this theory of Trudy Adams being a drug mule? And she said, quote, laughable. That's interesting. Somebody charged with a very serious drug offence who was from the area and knows her, just not on. So these are the people that actually were doing it? That, they, were, saying... they were caught. And they're saying it's a laughable notion that she would be involved in something like that. Yeah. One of the rumours that sprung up is she was linked up with some drug importing syndicate and she refused to cooperate and that's the reason she was murdered. I think we've debunked that. I think the police don't believe it. I don't believe it. She was going for a holiday. She was really, really happy to be going to Bali. We need to start talking to people who knew Neville Tween. As they searched bushland, police had a hunch about what happened to Trudy Adams. Looks like the same persons are responsible. They're brought to this area and uh, one of the girls in particular has described an area that the rape took place. Right until his death in 2013, Neville Tween denied any involvement with Trudy and the rapes. 
but some of the rape victims identified Tween as one of their attackers. And he also had a previous conviction for an indecent assault in Karingai National Park. We're going to investigate that crime, look for similarities to the 14 rapes, and whether there are any links to Trudy's disappearance. Three years before Trudy disappeared, Detective Bob Inkster investigated a crime at a bush site near the Northern Beaches. What were you coming down here to try to find? We received a telephone call from North Sydney detectives who were investigating a, a very uh, serious sexual assault up here. They had a suspect in mind and all they knew was his Christian name was Nev and that he was in possession of an M1 machine gun. It immediately rang bells with the people in my office. They knew Neville. Nev immediately. Immediately, wow. that had to be Neville Brian Tween. A known safe cracker and explosives expert, Tween had also been arrested for breaking into a military base and stealing weapons, including a machine gun. You think this is where it might have been? I couldn't say with any certainty that this was the spot, but it was very similar to this. At the site, Bob found evidence. Stolen safes blown open, a hidden cache of alcohol, later identified as the proceeds of a robbery, and some women's underwear. But the victim of this crime was a man. A young man was selling cannabis in the North Sydney area in small amounts. He met up with an offender by the name of Gary Batt. Batt said, well, my friend likes that. I'll buy it from you. Bat gave it to Neville Tween. And when uh, he opened it, he found it had been completely adulterated. Bits of grass and parsley chopped up to boost up the sale. The dealer had misjudged his new clients. Tween wasn't one to cross. Bat drove him up here to the scrub. And lo and behold, Tween comes out of the bush. At that stage, was wearing overalls and a full motorcycle helmet and he was carrying an M1 machine gun. He then commenced to fire the uh, machine gun around his ankles. Then they ordered their victim to dig his own grave. They gave him the mattock and the shovel and said, start digging. The young fellow then, begging for his life, had promised the two that if they would let him go, he would compensate them with a large amount of money. And before they let him go, they stripped him dressed him in female's underwear. They then did some horrendous sexual act upon him, which included having him fillet Gary Bat, and they inserted Cabanossi sausage into his anus. For what reason, I've got no idea. And at that time, Neville Tween took photographs of it with a Polaroid camera. <laughs> Turned loose, the victim reported the assault, and Bob's team raided Neville Tween's home. Tween could well have had the M1 machine gun in the house. We hit the door with a sledgehammer. He came straight out of his bedroom and we arrested him in the lounge room. A search of Tween's shed uncovered the Polaroid photographs. When you came across the Polaroids at Neville Tween's house of yeah. the assault, what was the first thing that you thought? Gotcha. It's the first thing we thought. Neville Tween and Gary Batt spent just six months in jail for this brutal assault. And one detail worries Bob to this day. With the great benefit of hindsight, and bearing in mind this was three years prior to Trudy Adams' disappearance, I've often asked myself, what would they be doing with young females' underwear at that time in the scrub here at Terry Hills? Could it have been that that underwear that they dressed this young man in had been kept as a trophy? from a previous sexual assault. So it wouldn't surprise you if Neville Tween was involved in some of those other rapes on the northern beaches? I would not be surprised at all. He was a most violent and evil career criminal. I believe he was capable of committing any form of violent crime. Murder? It would not be out of his capability, no. At the 2011 inquest into Trudy's disappearance, 
Gary Batt recalled how he fell out with Tween after their conviction. When Neville Tween told his old partner in crime, disappear or I'll make you disappear, he feared for his life and fled to Victoria. Gary Batt said it was a moment that confirmed Tween was not only crazy, but also a sexual deviant. I wouldn't like to have him chase me down a dark alley of a night time. So, no, he's, he's a hard man. So it's clear Neville Tween was a violent and dangerous man. But could he have committed all 14 rapes in the National Park? In the 70s, Tween was in and out of jail for various offences. I'm going to compare the dates of the 14 rapes with the periods he wasn't in jail. So in 1971, there's the first attacks in Sydney's northern beaches that we know of. So that's two separate attacks. At some point in 1971, Neville Tween moves to Adelaide. In July, he's jailed for three years and nine months. While Tween's locked up in South Australia, no rapes of this kind were reported. In 1975, there's this attack on a young man, which we know about because Tween was actually convicted. In 1975, Neville Tween is in jail. In 1977, these attacks start again. And then 1978 is the big year. They really ramp up. In April, there's two separate vicious attacks. And then on the 25th of June, Trudy Adams disappears. So it's confronting to look at these all lined up like this. It all goes quiet when he's not there. And then these horrible escalating attacks happen, you know, in the, a few months after he moves back. That's, that's quite confronting. It just brings home what a dangerous time it would have been to be on the northern beaches then. Women are just getting picked off every couple of weeks. Key details of these rapes match Tween's cruel attack on the young drug dealer. How does someone become capable of such brutality? It's time to dig deeper into Neville Tween's criminal history. Retired policeman Brian McVicker went to school with Neville Tween. Which one is he? Uh, Neville's right there next to the plaque. He would have been about 12 or 13. Righto. He's uh, got a big smile on his face. He has. Always had a younger, cherubic-looking face. Just always had that sort of smile. Always kept himself neat and tidy. So during those school years, did you ever hear or ever see him being intimidating or threatening in any way? No. The main thing was breaking into shops and things like that, because one story, one day, someone said, oh, Neville's got pockets full of lollies. With the rumours, he'd been in someone's premises and uh, helped himself. But I spoke to a few of the police later on about him, and they said he was the toughest kid they'd ever dealt with. I always knew him as Neville Tiffin. It was only much later in my police service that I found out his, his uh, name was actually Neville Tween. Aliases would become a big part of Tween's criminal career. Brian, I've just wanted to show you some documents. It's actually his criminal record, which yep. was tendered at the inquest. It starts off with the aliases, Tiffin, Tween. No, oh, Fraser, Jesus. Anderson. And he first gets it in trouble at the ripe old age of nine. Nine. He's nine. Yeah, he's into it, yeah. He's into it. And it just goes on. Break in and steal, yeah. Assault police, resist yeah. arrest, steal, malicious damage, possession of explosives. It reads quite good, doesn't it? But you can see here he's slowly getting into the drug scene a bit because you've got him possession of a drug and cultivate as well, so he's, he's changed his activities. He's changed his MO a bit. Yeah. When Brian was a young detective, a chance encounter in Sydney reunited the old schoolmates and revealed how different they'd become. I just left Central Court and I was walking back to the CIB and I noticed who it was coming down on the same side of the footpath. And as he got close, I said, G'day, Nev. And he denied that it was him. He said, my name's not Neville. I said, Neville, I used to go to school with you. He said, you got the wrong bloke. 
as I turned around, I saw him go into a hotel further down. So knowing his reputation, I then went to a phone and rang the braking squad, knowing that he was involved in braking into premises and involved with safes. And they sent a, a two or three of their senior detectives down to have a yarn with him in the pub. And he was there with Len Evans in the hotel. This is the same Len Evans who allegedly told a cellmate that he and Tween had raped women in Karingai National Park. Evans has denied this. What about him makes you think that he is capable of progressing from these sorts of crimes to, to rape and murder? Look, from what I know of uh, Neville, he was capable of anything and everything. It was fascinating to meet somebody who knew Neville Tween as a young boy where it all started to go wrong, and obviously started to go wrong at a very young age. What caused that? We don't really know. It started to go wrong when he was nine in Kalgoorlie, and we just can't trace that back. Despite Tween's record and all the circumstantial evidence, why did it take 30 years for him to be questioned about the rapes or Trudy? The 71-year-old was questioned about a string of rapes on the northern beaches during the 1970s, Tween denying any involvement in the teenager's disappearance. In 2008, the Trudy Adams cold case was reopened and a $250,000 reward offered for any information that led to a result. Gavin McKean was the cold case detective who finally fronted Tween about Trudy. He didn't have to hunt for him. Tween was serving 18 years for trying to import cocaine and expected to die in jail. I'm not a psychologist, but he came across to me void of any empathy and kind of interested in the crime and why we didn't come to him earlier and why we didn't speak to him earlier and, and the failings of the police and almost skirting very close to, you didn't get me, did you? You couldn't get me. So a little bit cocky? On those particular moments, he was, yeah. He would often repeat lines, and he did the same in the inquest, lines of, well, you failed to speak to me back then, almost in a way of, why are you talking to me now? You couldn't get me back then. But Gavin couldn't use some of the most damning evidence against Tween. By today's standards, the photo identification process in the 70s was flawed. The selection of photos shown to the rape victims contained three different images of the suspect. That process would not stand up in court now. It's a really awkward phenomenon. So, for example, a photo board that was done back then, that complied back then, didn't comply post-1995 Evidence Act, but couldn't be redone, because that also infringes the Evidence Act. Some of those victims, 30 years later, did pick out Neville Bryan Tween as a, as a person responsible for assaulting them, but it wasn't evidence that you could use in a prosecution. It had already been done uh, in, a, in an inferior photo board. You can't double dip with an identification. But there may be another reason why Tween escaped questioning in 1978. Not long after Trudy disappeared, police say they were called by his lawyer he said his client would not answer any questions about Trudy Adams. He was a solicitor that was well known to the underworld. When he called the officer in charge, it may have put the wind up the officer in charge a little bit. The lawyer later denied making the call, and it's unclear how he knew Tween was a suspect. Do you think that's what police at the time thought, that they had had a leak within their investigation? There might have been. It could have been interpreted as a, as a warning. Well, I can only speculate that it may have been seen as a threat. It was in the 70s. I think it's not unfair to say that there was a lot of organised crime uh, that included some corrupt police back in those times. So to get a phone call like that from someone in, in, in those circles, I wouldn't maybe go as far as a threat, but maybe a, a warning that, you know, this guy's connected. If the reason that Trudy Adams' disappearance and probable murder has never been solved is because there was some interference and that's disgraceful. And I think that's where we'll be focusing our investigations to find out if that's what happened. It's clear Tween had connections, but the question is, how influential were they? 
In 2007, Detective Jason McLeod began investigating the cold case of a murdered heroin dealer and his girlfriend. He found a trail that led to Tween and Trudy. So what we've got is Andrea Wharton being involved in drugs, disappears 1984, body never found. Her boyfriend disappeared, body never found, 1985. The really interesting thing about his disappearance is that he was going to a pub in Manly to meet up with Neville Tween. Neville Tween was involved in drugs with Tony Yelovich until Tony suddenly disappeared. The previous year, his girlfriend, Andrea Wharton, also went missing. What is chilling is that her body is never found, his body is never found, and Trudy's body never found. And it's really the first time anyone in police makes the connection between all of these cases. Yeah. Not long after Jason McLeod began digging into Neville Tween, he was taken off the case. What unfolded terrified Jason and played a big part in him quitting the force. I think this is it on the, on the left. Jason's never been interviewed before, but he's agreed to meet us in the hope that he might be able to contribute to a breakthrough in Trudy's case. Jason, hi. Yes, come on in. I interviewed a former surveillance officer who was working on Tween back in the late 70s and 80s, and he told me straight up their jobs were regularly compromised. They were laying in a wait outside, I think it was a Terry Hills premises, where um, Neville was residing. They were going to follow him to do a particular job, and Neville walked out the front of the premises and looked down the street and gave, gave the surveillance operatives away. He knew they were there. He knew they were there, yeah. Tween certainly was very aware of what was going on. Someone was giving him inside information. There was inside information getting back to him, absolutely. Yeah. Had you heard of Trudy Adams before? I actually hadn't. Here I am, I'm finding Auntie Yelovich, but then there's Andrea Wharton, the disappearance of Trudy, and also the gang rapes of all the young girls. It was pretty clear that this was something that needed a large task, task force to, to address competently. Jason's superiors didn't agree. It was not considered to be a high priority case. But he was determined to pursue the case. In 2008, he handed his investigation plan to someone he thought could make things happen. Mark Standen, Assistant Director of the New South Wales Crime Commission, one of the most powerful law enforcement officers in the country. He made it very clear that he wanted um, to be in on the investigation, uh, made it very clear that he was going to support it, but it just it didn't eventuate. According to Jason, Standen began stalling. He was offering excuses as to why we couldn't come in and meet. I was frustrated because I knew that it was go time. Jason kept working on the case. While following up on a search of the police database, he claims he made a discovery that shocked him. That Neville Tween had been nominated um, on the job application by Matthew Standen as a referee, as a family referee, for Matthew to join the New South Wales Police Force. Matthew Standen is Mark Standen's son. It was read to me verbatim, which was, in essence, that Neville used to go away with the family on weekend getaways and diving trips, camping trips, and he was regarded as a, as a so-called uncle. Both Mark and Matthew Standen have denied Matthew used Neville Tween as a reference, but Mark Standen admits his family was close to Tween's, and it was this closeness that alarmed Jason. Something really, really wrong, really wrong. I mean, words can't... Actually, words can't describe, for, for me, I can't describe just how significant that relationship was. Mark Standen also knew Neville Tween professionally. We've been told he registered him as an informant in 1994. But was their relationship closer than informant and police officer? I also learnt during that short period of time that Mark had gone uh, and visited Neville Tween in prison um, after I had provided him with my investigation plan. Knowing Tween's violent history, Jason became fearful. Immediately I realised the investigation has been compromised, my safety's been compromised. It was very clear to me that there was bigger problems than what I was already up against. There was occasions obviously going to work, starting the car and <laughs> waiting for a boom. You're talking about getting into the car and you're worried if there's going to be a bomb. 
Yes, going absolutely, off. absolutely. Yeah, these guys were explosive experts, and they had no qualm about taking somebody out if they needed to. Jason told his superiors what he'd discovered, but nothing happened, and he was ordered to hand his investigation over to the cold case unit. Frightened and disillusioned, Jason McLeod quit the police. There was so much damage done emotionally that it was a good thing to go. It was a good thing to go. It was, it was the right thing to dust myself off and start again. Yeah, it's disappointing, but it is what it is. But the web that seemed to link Tween and Standen was only beginning to reveal itself. In 2008, Mark Standen was arrested for conspiracy to import pseudoephedrine, a precursor to ICE. One of the country's top cops was corrupt and the close friend of a career criminal and violent sexual predator. When did Twin and Standen first meet? Was it the late 70s around when Trudy disappears, or is it a little bit later? It's 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 not quite clear, but yeah, that's something that's obviously fairly crucial for us. Yeah. Jason believes they could have met around the time Trudy disappeared. I think this is the first time it's been suggested that they could have met all the way back in 1978. Yeah. I think we need to keep following that and see if we can pin that down. Mm. With Neville Tween dead. Could Mark Standen be one of the last people alive to have information about Trudy Adams? Next time, we question Mark Standen about his unholy relationship with Neville Tween. Really, the puppet master isn't Standen, it's Tween. No one seemed to be looking into it. No one seemed prepared to be looking into it. Tween and the criminal justice system go head to head over Trudy. Not once. Did they even show a photograph to line me up to see the girls? And we put our discoveries to the test. Would they be enough to prosecute the man we believe killed Trudy Adams?